what I would like to do in this talk is really three things. I'm going to, to some extent, reiterate the basis of computer-based maths for two reasons, really. I want to make sure we're all on the same page for the conference so that everybody knows what, what the basis is we're starting from. Uh, also, for those of you who are new and perhaps haven't followed this right from the outset, to give a good idea of, of you know, how, how this is. I, my apologies to people who sort of heard this before, but I hope I'm adding some slightly different insights that we've had uh, over how to explain this and describe this and think about this in the last year or so. Um, secondly, I want to talk about where we're going with computerbasedmath.org, the things we've done, uh, the directions we're, we're heading with that, and thirdly, just to look at the objectives for, for today and tomorrow in the summit. So let me start off with really talking about, I guess, what, what I'm starting to call the maths versus maths issue. You know, we have two very different subjects that are going around. There's one subject that is growing in popularity all the time, has had tremendous growth over the last few decades, is popular, is used all over the place, drives our economies. And there's another subject that is more despised than it has been in many points in the past, seems irrelevant to many people, seems like it's a real chore to do, and seems hard to get. And of course, I'm talking about real world maths. In the first case, I'm talking about maths in education. I think we really need to think in large sense that these are two somewhat separated subjects. They have become separated. And a lot of what we need to talk about today is not so much the process necessarily of learning this, although that will come up in many sessions, but the basic idea that the content has come adrift in many cases. And it's come adrift because Computers have driven maths in the real world. Computers are the things that do the calculating. And because they've done the calculating in the real world, they have driven so much more usage of maths across all the disciplines. So let's go into this a bit further. I often talk about why we learn maths. And I still think there are basically three reasons. Technical jobs, you know, which drive the most developed economies in the world and others. Everyday living, as I call it. You know, just being able to function in a modern and even not so modern society today is a far more quantitative process than it has been uh, ever in, in human history. And thirdly, what you might call logical mind training, although, you know, there are various different ways to characterize this. But basically, thinking, conceptualizing. Maths has been the most amazing way of, in which humans have managed to conceptualize ideas in a logical fashion and to understand how to proceed logically with things. And that is a really important part, I think, of why people should be learning maths. What is maths? The four steps that we've talked about, posing the right questions real world to maths formulation, computation, step three, and turning the results back. So sort of two is taking real world into math. Four is taking math back to the real world and making sure it makes some sense. What's the problem? The problem is we're spending, for three right now, 80% of the time or so in education teaching people how to do it by hand. But that's not what we should be doing. That's what computers do really well. What we should be doing is using students primarily for doing one, two, and four, and using computers to do step three. That way we can drive harder, more conceptual problems. We can go faster. We can go further. People can gain much more experience. That's the basis of what we're talking about with computer-based math. So math is not equal to calculating. It's a much bigger subject. And if you try and equate the two, and, and by the way, you know, often I have to say in politics, these get equated even further. It's like there's numeracy. Right? Numeracy equals calculating that equals maths. Well, that's not the case. That, you know, I was told off by my daughter some years ago. She's now learned better. But uh, she told me, I didn't know, you know, they didn't do maths. They did numeracy. That's what they did. Uh, and I was told off because I didn't know any numeracy, which may be true. But uh, uh, so, you know, we've got to separate and understand the separation between these. You know, the key issue here is the subject matter, the subject matter of the maths. That's the sort of central part of this conference. Not, there's also how we learn the process of learning that, but the subject matter is kind of the central thing and is what is often not considered when talking about maths reform. What are the objections that people bring up? First one, you've got to get the basics first. Until you get the basics, you can't understand how to do it. I think what they mean is you shouldn't use a computer before you've used paper. Right? I think that's what this typically means in this context. Um, now, 
you know, what I've normally said about this is, you know, is that saying you shouldn't drive a car, shouldn't learn how to drive a car until you've understood automotive engineering? I actually think a more recent example of this is photography. You know, do we think if somebody's trying to learn to be, take photos or be a photographer, that the first thing they should learn is how to process a film or indeed how to coat a plate? I mean, I don't think so, right? I mean, I think those were mechanics of the moment for photography some time ago. Things have moved on. The mechanics, the objective of photography in its creative and you know, other reasons for doing photography because it's representing things in a nice way, that's the objective. The way we do it varies with time, and so it is with, with mathematics. So my argument is the basics are steps one, two, and four. That process, operating that process, the mechanism of how we operate that process can change and has changed dramatically. And by the way, I do not think this question of the basics, what one insight I've had in the last year, this is not just a maths problem in education. Okay, I've been thinking of it primarily as a maths problem. But actually, there's a whole question around education. What's the point of education in general? And I think there's a big upset happening outside maths as well, saying, hang on just a moment, you know, the, the traditional Victorian way we've done things and the reasons we're doing it doesn't quite hang together in the way that it might have done. So I think there's, there's a debate outside maths, and, and I, Tim Oates in particular is very, very well aware of all of those things. Now, another thing I wanted to point out is, uh, Another insight we've had perhaps in the last year is what I call mechanic-centered versus problem-centered curriculum. If you look at a typical maths curriculum today, it's labeled by the mechanics of what you're doing, the calculating. You know, I'm, this is a section on inverting matrices or on solving simultaneous equations, right? Those are the mechanics of what you're doing. You know, that's how you load your film into your camera. What we should be doing is problem-centered. The curriculum should be designed by the problem. You know, and these are example problems. You know, make a perfect password for your login. What's a beautiful shape? Design a currency. You know, what do you have to think about? Or, you know, things that, you know, by how much do you need to compress a photo or video or music before you notice? Well, you can actually go try it once you have a computer, right? Because, you know, these are things you can only realistically do. And you can see that, oh my gosh, as I do compression, you can see how it, it, it really affects it. And, you know, I can change the kind of compression and see whether that makes a difference and what different artifacts I get. My point about this is these are the real problems that people actually need to solve. They're very engaging to most people, but they're also the reality, and they're also conceptually empowered. So the curriculum, in my view, should be labeled by problems, not by the mechanics, and that's a key issue, I think, in, in understanding sort of the basics Computers dumb math down, typical objection we get. And, you know, this is one of the things, if you, imply, if you apply the, the machinery the wrong way to do the wrong thing, you'll get the wrong result. That's kind of what this one amounts to. Yes, you can use computers to dumb down what you're doing in maths by turning everything into a multiple choice question and, you know, using them to kind of replace any interactive teaching. All of that can happen. Um, the real point is, if you use computers to actually do the maths, which is what they do in the real world, if you imitate the real world, you actually undumb the maths. In fact, I'd argue the real problem right now is dumbed down problems, not, uh, the, uh, um, not the fact that computers are dumbing them down. And, you know, it's a simple example. If you go solve, oh, I don't know, uh, let's say the normal thing you do, um, you know, uh, in a school maths thing, right? You would solve x squared plus 2x plus 1, and you'd spend a long time learning the quadratic formula, which I've probably forgotten for a long time. But the real point is, that's an equation. Where do equations actually crop up? And, you know, in real life, you get different, different kinds of things. You know, I mean, you know, it might be a, a cubic instead, and then you get a more complicated result, right? Now, the fact that that's a much more complicated result is kind of invariant with the point that this was an equation and that people need to understand when to apply equations and what to do with the result. But, you know, you do get hair all over stuff in real life. It isn't all a quadratic equation with nice parameters. That's just what happens. But, you know, with a computer, it doesn't make much difference. You need to know how to handle it. You need to know how to work with the automation. And then you can have problems. This is one of the key mistakes I think governments often make. They think that somehow the computer dumbs the problem down. What it actually does is it releases you, as it has in the real world, to have much harder problems that are more realistic. That's what the computer cor used correctly can do. Okay, hand calculating procedures teach understanding. 
Well, I don't totally disagree. They teach one sort of understanding of procedurizing, but there's a much better way to procedurize things today. It's called programming. And it is very encouraging that in the last year, particularly in the UK, programming has kind of come to the fore in a much greater way than it had for many, many years. And that's, that's, that's really pleasing to see. Because I think programming actually, but I actually think programming is a broader thing even than people currently are believing it is with respect to maths. And we have a session later, by the way, to discuss you know, what's the relationship between maths, ICT, programming, and computer science, which are all somehow interconnected, but it's, it's sort of you know, interesting to figure out how they're connected. One thing I've been saying is that composition is to English. If, if, you're in, if your native language is English, you can translate from English to whichever your native language is here. Composition is to English sort of what programming is to maths. So what I mean by that is it's the way you write down what you're doing. Now, traditionally in maths, you write that down with mathematical notation. But I've got to tell you, mathematical notation only caters to a fairly small fraction of what you nowadays want to write down for mathematics. And the more general way to write down mathematics is with a program. And so I think that far from programming being a computer, I mean, you can define these things in different ways. And my, my way of thinking about it, but I, I don't, I'm happy with other ways too, is that in fact, programming is a central part of maths in the, the, the subject we would term maths. And um, that, you know, there's also a subject computer science, which is kind of the, the calligraphy of programming. But you can define it in different ways. It doesn't really matter which way you define it. The, the basic point is everyone needs to learn how to program, at least at some level, just to be able to express themselves. Just the way you learn how to write in English, you learn how to program in maths or whatever so that you can express yourself for, for what you want to do technically. Added another objection. Is there evidence it works? I, if you put a computer and make it do the calculation. Is there evidence that this works? This will work for teaching maths. So first thing I ask people is, did it work in the real world? Well, yes. <laughs> maths is predominant in the real world because of computers. I mean, that's it's just, there's a no-brainer there. And frankly, it's far more conceptual. So that's number one. The second thing is, if you accept that there's a somewhat different subject of the educational maths that, that insists on this hand calculating and the maths that doesn't in the real world, you've then got to ask about whether having a proxy subject, as we currently have, is in fact the best way for people to learn. So, so the real question I'm arguing is it's actually reverse. It's the corollary of the, of the question. The real question should be, does having a somewhat different subject that we're teaching students from the real world subject actually work? And the other question is, what does work mean? What are the outcomes we're trying to address with this? What are, what are the, the results we're trying to get out when people have finished their maths education? I would argue really empowered applied problem solving comes top of the list. You know, I wouldn't argue that being able to hand calculate lots of things comes high up for most things. But anyway, is there evidence it works? I think the argument will increasingly turn round to, is there evidence that teaching essentially slightly the wrong subject works. You know, I was taught Latin for many years. I still don't quite understand why I was taught Latin. Nobody actually explained that to me. Okay? I think the reason I was taught Latin was because it was a proxy for learning English grammar and modern languages. I didn't ever learn English grammar, though I know a certain amount through Latin. Now, you know, the big question there is, is it, was it the right thing to teach me Latin instead of English grammar when English grammar was what I actually needed? Don't know. I think actually the argument for Latin is stronger than the argument for teaching traditional, what I call the history of hand calculating, traditional maths, as against uh, real world maths that I'm talking about that's computer based. The other big thing I've been learning is that conceptual is practical. You see, there's this big split people talk about, the vocational versus the intellectual. I'm not seeing it in the modern world. Most things that you need to do in the modern world are actually quite hard conceptually. You know, including a lot of things that are considered sort of, you know, fairly manual kind of jobs. You know, the fact is, plumbing a house today is quite complicated, and you actually need to understand quite a lot, understand quite a lot of what's going on and be able to calculate things quite well, set up problems. It's not that simple, right? I mean, there are things that are, you know, you know epidemiology is, is, you know, has harder maths in, in some of it, but it, it's, it's, you know, a lot of these things are conceptual and practical. We shouldn't make a big split there. I think that's something I've sort of been learning recently. Now, I've talked before about 
the fact that you know we can do calculus early and you know by just doing it a different way thinking about it a different way the fact that you can make everything smaller 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 you know is amenable to a 5 year old and the fact that this polygon turns into a circle when you have a, an infinite number of sides you know my 5 year old and many others will get that it, it comes very naturally there's no reason why we have to wait till people are 15 or, or more to teach them any calculus, because we were stuck teaching them by the, by the order of computational complexity rather than conceptual complexity. The fact is, it isn't conceptually that hard much of calculus. It's hard to compute. We should teach it early. You know, thermodynamics. It's kind of amusing when you watch these things. You can actually, you know, go squeeze the box, right, and you see that the, uh, the pressure goes up. You can actually see what's going on there. You know, let's increase the temperature. A little bit of artistic license with the color changing, but whatever. Uh, the, um, but the thing is, you know, the fact that you can play with this, actually get to grips with this. Yes, you're not necessarily looking at the equation. You know, people much younger than we're currently doing can understand. So I'm claiming we can get much better conceptual understanding much earlier by doing, uh, using computers for the subject. So the key point I want to make sure everyone's clear on for the conference is, the primary thing we're talking about here is computer-based maths, not computer-assisted. So let me just be clear what I'm meaning there. Computer-based means you use the computer to do the subject of maths. Computer-assisted means that you use the computer in the process of learning or teaching. Now, I'm all for computer assistance. I'm all for using computers to improve the process of learning and teaching. That's great. And in fact, one thing I've understood more in the last year is that these two are more intertwined than I thought. To get really good computer-based math delivery, you need more computer assistance than with, you can't just have a traditional classroom the traditional way. But the focus, that the thing that's gone so badly wrong is in past manifestations of people using computers on maths is that they haven't changed the subject largely. They said, let's take the, the same subject we've been teaching for the last n years, and let's get the computer to so serve up the problems better. You know, like the person who showed me that they were, they were very proud of the fact that they can, uh, you know, the, the computer can, can solve lots of, uh, uh, you know, they can be, there are lots of things they can do with the computer leading them through, but, but that's different from having the computer actually do the calculation. So we need to focus on that. And, you know, we will have a session later talking about computer assistance uh, and how games and other modalities of learning can really help this. And I think that's a, important, but we need to separate those. Fixed assessment. This comes up all the time. Everything in the end is driven by assessment. And the, what's said about assessment, what's actually done in assessment, will drive what's done. And so in the end, we need computers in assessment. There is no way around it. You know, one of the things that I've realized over the last year or so, is the extent to which assessment has been so perturbed away from testing what's in the real world. Pe people, one of the mistakes I think that's been made in maths and other things is that people believe that somehow if something is reproducibly markable, it's fair. That's not the case. Just because you can get 10 people to mark it and they get the same marks, that doesn't mean it, what I, one big measure of fairness for me is does it represent what people in the real world actually do as well as possible? Now, one of the problems is if you don't have computers and exams, what you end up with is questions that are banal for, think, I mean, for things like statistics, data, right? You end up with, you know, here are five points. Nobody analyzes five points with distributions. They don't do that. They have thousands of points. That's what they do because they use computers. And you get banal questions, which, are, which are sort of don't make any sense often, because you've got to push them into this constraint of being able to hand calculate. So there's a big issue with fixing assessment and uh, a good discussion to have on that. And one of the things that you know, I've also been understanding is the extent to which maths marketing needs to be fixed. So when um, the primary curriculum got announced. I know Tim and I have talked about this at, at length. I, I actually think many good things in there, indeed. But one of the things that was said about it was that, you know, long division was very important. Now, long division to me is at sort of the, the top of the list of things that really don't make much sense, right? I, I, part, part of the thing is, I, well, it doesn't help that I don't know how to do long division, but, um, but the fact is, you know, I don't know what the point of long division, learning long division is right now. It's a process 
that is irrelevant. It doesn't really empower you to do very much, in my view. And it, there are so many better things you could do instead of long division. So my point is, whether long division's in or out or whatever's done with it, marketing maths to put long division sort of on a list of things that you really care about in maths is a huge mistake. It may get votes short term and things, but it's not something that, that is going to win over people's respect for mathematics in the long term. And it's not going to enthuse students. You know, great, I can go and do long division. There aren't that many students who really want to go and say that. Whereas if it's like, I can go and solve this problem, how do I win at the next game I'm playing? That seems a lot more exciting. A few words about why us. How did we come into doing computer-based maths? Why are we in the middle of this? Well, it's kind of weird, but we've ended up being kind of the math company in terms of Wolfram, not computer-based math. That's the spin-off that's, that's been generated from Wolfram. Um, it's kind of like we're connected with mathematicians in every imaginable way, I realized. So it's like we hire mathematicians, we sell Mathematica to mathematicians, and people who use math, more importantly, that's about, by the way, 94% of people we sell Mathematica to do not classify themselves as mathematicians. Interesting, interesting piece of data for how you set curricula. Um, you know, we interact with people at every level of math, so we're kind of very centrist, and we know about the technology. And it's actually amusing. I, I was thinking about this a couple nights ago, and I remembered a quote that Steve Jobs gave us right back at the release of Mathematica. And it's kind of interesting. Mathematica will revolutionize the teaching and learning of math by focusing on the pros of mathematics without getting lost in the grammar. Kind of interesting. It's sort of like, a pro, you know, it's parallel to what we're talking about with computer-based maths. It was a Jobs formulation, I think, as I now realize. And um, it's, it's rather interesting, because I think, in a sense, that is what we're saying. Maths has got lost in its mechanics of how you calculate. And what we should be focused on is, is the bigger picture of what the objective is. Why now? There's huge impetus around the world. And I have, this has grown in the last year. I have, you know, every country, pretty much, is worried about their maths. They see that it, there's this gap that they can't educate the people, people aren't educated enough, nobody's happy, that's grown. Ubiquity of devices has also grown. It is, you know, almost, uh, um, you know, everybody has access in these developed places. I know that's coming in other places. It's, uh, and they have access almost all of the time. So it's not just that there's a computer in existence. You know, by the time you include phones and pads and iPods and everything else, the ubiquity thing is getting solved. An interface, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, the fact that you could interface in any way with the the uh, the kind of mathematics, and I did this demo last year, but you know, I can't resist trying to do it again, which is to ask Siri a question here. Um, solve x cubed plus two x plus one equals zero, and we'll see uh, what's happening. So Siri, willing, uh, this will. OK, so let me try and align this, and hopefully you will see the answer to that question. That was the cubic equation I solved earlier by hand. But my point about this is the interfaces are so easy, and they're getting easier. I mean, we have a lot of new technology just coming on that as well. You know, this is not a problem of interfacing to the technology. It's, it's lessening. That problem is moving rapidly away. Let me just go over a few of the technological effects that I see the changing subject of maths, that's what we talked about, computer-based maths. The other thing to do with computer-assisted is individualized learning. As computers are able to help in the process of learning, we can individualize the learning much more. And I know there are a lot of people around the world doing that, and that obviously will apply to maths as well as it applies to other subjects, and is a very important direction. The other big thing is real data. You know, let's not get our kids to work with data that's all fake. It's all out there. The real stuff, the real stuff is out there. And, you know, let's use it. It's much more exciting, particularly when it's in real time. Usability, we've talked about, and interactive, interactivity, the fact that you can interact with materials in a way and that that's much easier to produce. So what have we been doing at computer-based maths? Uh, let me just highlight a few things quickly, and obviously much of this conference will, will talk about some of those things. I think the big news really is we started to build a curriculum. We have started to actually lay out modules and work out in detail what those look like. And you know, we're at an early stage. 
And I guess the stage we're really at now is we're looking and selecting partners around the world to work with to really make this go around the world in lots of different countries. And I don't know, uh, you know where we'll go first, but that process has moved quite a long way um, in the last year. Now, as I said last time, we sort of think about this in several ways. We think about the topics, and I showed you a few earlier, the problem-centered approach. We think about modules, which are sort of the, the pieces that, that sort of fit under each of those questions. And then we think about what we call modalities, um, by which I mean uh, the, uh, um, you know, in a sense, the way in which you execute teaching or learning those things. And I've just made a list here of some of those modalities that I think are important as kind of, in a sense, things that people need to know how to do. So actually, there are several dimensions of this. I've slightly confused this in what I've just said. There, modalities really are ways in which you uh, allow the material to be presented, uh, work with the material. But there's also outcomes. And frankly, we're a bit confused right now, and I hope we'll con solve a bit in this conference, what these different dimensions of output, output really are. You know, I think people need to know how to estimate and synthesize and critique and verify. Mostly things they're rather bad at doing, by the way, from traditional maths. I mean, actually appalling at doing in many cases. Critiquing is not part of traditional maths. You know, it's, part of, it's part of, I don't know, philosophy, but it's not part of maths for some reason. Um, you know, implying and interpreting, communicating and collaborating, these are crucial parts, and programming, right? We talked about programming earlier. Now, there's another thing that I've added in, which is tools of maths. One of the things I've realized is you need to know what it is, what, the, what is the toolkit that is at your disposal? You know, if, if, you're, if you're doing DIY, you know there's a certain toolkit that you have. You know, you can have a spanner and a screwdriver and these other things, right? There's a certain toolkit. And the fact that you know that a spanner exists as a way to turn a nut is an important thing to know. If you didn't know that, then you'd be struggling. And so there's a similar toolkit of maths. Now, it doesn't mean you need to know how to make a spanner necessarily or forge it, but it does need, you, know, you need to know it's there. And so I think there's an important use of, you know, I, I understand that what an equation is, when I might use an equation, when it applies what to do with the answer, which is a completely discrepant skill necessarily for knowing how to solve it. We have a community that's, that's growing. And I, one of the things I'm pleased about is, you know, you often get fizz at the beginning of things and then things start to tail off. That really has not happened here. CBM has got bigger in the last year uh, by quite a long way than it has in previous years. And one of the things we're doing, I think it's either live or just about to go live, we're launching a forum on our site so that we can hopefully get much more activity between conferences and other gatherings of people talking about things. So the, the theme for last year's summit was, in an era of ubiquitous computing, how should we rebuild maths education from the ground up to keep pace with and drive progress in the real world? That's still a theme for now. We're still considering that question, and we've made progress on it. But we sort of have an additional, uh, this year's focus, which is, what are the steps to delivering computer-based math education worldwide? So I think we need to kind of get, hopefully, more specific about some of the actual deliverables that we're talking about. I think the concluding thing I'd like to say, a set of things anyway, is I'm realizing that what I'm talking about with maths, with computer-based maths, is really an example of standing on the power of automation and technology. And this has happened in other cases before, although they're not as, I can't think of examples that are so clear-cut. But all the time in education, one of the things we've got to consider is as new machinery and technology comes along, we need to change what the subject matter of the education is because people don't need to know certain bits of subject matter. I live in a house, but I don't know how to build a house. Right? I don't need to know how to build a house. I don't need to use all my educational energy to know how to build a house. It's just not the, the general purpose thing. If I want to become a builder, I need to know that. But that's a more specialized thing. That's not the general purpose subject. And what's happened in maths is we've had an automation revolution. Maths got industrialized, whichever way you like to put it. That's what computers did. They took out the piece in the middle that required the most human manual effort, you know, working in the factory, assembling something, and they put, it, put, a, put a computer there, and they did it automatically. We put a machine there. There are two reactions to that, right? Reaction one is, you still got to learn how to do it by hand, even though the machine's there. You know, it will fail. 
So one thing that I'm quite confident at, you know, if you look in 20 years, there are two outcomes for the subject of maths as we see it today. One is it got sidelined and it turned into ancient Greek. <laughs> right? Ancient Greek's a fine subject, but I don't think you can justify teaching everyone around the world ancient Greek. Or it becomes computer-based and matches the real world subject. Those are the options. And I'm almost sure it will be the, the, the latter of the options, whether it continues to be termed maths or not. The question is, where first? How does that get executed? How does that actually happen? But that it will happen, I think, is undoubted. And um, what I think is exciting about this group and this conference is, we may look back in years gone by, uh, in, in years to come, we may look back and say, you know, this was some of the things we were doing and discussing here were pretty pivotal, pivotal discussions for the future of maths as it ended up several decades later. So outcomes for this conference that we'd like to achieve. I think we're trying to fill out some more of the conceptual details that we have laid out for computer-based maths. We've got more of that to do. We've got to move towards implementation and really understanding the details of what, what, what outputs we want, what are the best ways to produce those. I think another thing that's increasingly important is we need to continue to raise the debate publicly. You know, what I've noticed is the more I talk to, you know, quotes the general public about this, the more I get a positive reaction. But it doesn't happen instantly. One headline is not going to work. It's not going to get us where we need to be. So what we need to do is have a reasoned, escalating public debate. And there is appetite for this debate. And we'll see in the session later, I think the mic's running, uh, that, um, you know, what the sort of reactions have been to CBM. We also need a plan for uh, delivery, and that's something that we're, we're starting to work on. So the big picture is, let's take math and unscramble it and reach for the real thing. Thanks very much.